there. You gotta keep them under control. Let's Time out. Being on the throne is not just about being the king, it's about being the rival to beat. And you also gotta be willing to prove your superiority to any opponent who aspires to kingship. And that was exactly the situation for Larry Bird in 1986. I'd much rather guard Michael Jordan than Larry Bird because you have to play the game as a thinker when you're playing him. The Celtics forward was not only coming off one of the most successful individual seasons in league history, winning his third consecutive regular season MVP and hoisting the Larry O'Brien while earning his second finals MVP. I'm really proud to, to receive this award for the third time. Bird was changing the game. The whole conception of the small forward was different after his time in the NBA. But just when he looked like he was the undisputed king, a new lion was coming to the pride. A young Michael Jordan came into the league making a difference right from the start. And from the very first moment, he made it clear to Larry that he wasn't afraid of him at all. The Celtics were still the better team, but MJ put on one of the greatest performances in playoff history against Boston in 1986, making a statement about who was the better player on the hardwood. And from then on, the rivalry burned hotter than ever. See, Larry Bird had a mission. For his entire career, he had been the undisputed best player in the NBA. But now, a 23-year-old kid who was averaging 37 points per game was challenging him for the reign of the king of world basketball. The bird had already proved it all. His legacy was unmatched, but his honor was in jeopardy. And that was something that he wouldn't allow. The reason was simple. Bird was bidding to become the GOAT of basketball. The forward had been breaking every barrier in existence since arriving to the NBA. In 1979, Bird signed a contract with the Celtics to become the highest paid rookie in league history at $650,000 per year. But as soon as he arrived in the NBA, Larry wreaked havoc. He finished fourth in the MVP race during his rookie year. During the next three seasons, not only did he win the NBA ring for the first time in 1981, but he also finished second in the MVP race three times. And his averages during this stint? 22.6 points, 10.9 rebounds, and 5.7 assists per game. But something happened during the summer of 1983. Bird went from being the second best player in the league to a completely legendary player and absolutely superior to his eternal rival, Magic Johnson. Thus began his incredible three-year stint in which he became one of the greatest players of all time. From 1983 to 1986, Bird achieved three NBA MVPs. After winning the 1984 championship and being for the first time in his career MVP of the finals, Bird ascended in the NBA Olympus and wrote his name in the history books forever. During those three seasons, Larry averaged 26.2 points, 10.1 rebounds, and 6.7 assists per game, while continuing to be an elite defender, by the way. This was his status just prior to the start of the 1986 playoffs, a versatile forward who was capable of doing everything on the court. There had never been a big man who had the skills of a perimeter player in traditional basketball until he came along. And not just because of his iconic three shot, becoming one of the first small forwards that played the power forward position to be able to stretch the floor. His incredible passing ability allowed him to become a true leader for those Celtics, both on offense and defense. But in order to win his third ring in 1986, he first had to get past a team with a major stud that was starting to make some noise. And just less than a full year later, it was March 27, 1987. The Celtics, with a record of 51 wins and 19 losses, were coming off a back-to-back -to, -back to face a Bulls team with a record of 35 wins and 35 losses that, by the way, was also coming off a game the night before. Bird was having a pretty good season with averages of 28 points, 9 rebounds, and almost 8 assists per game that allowed him to finish third in the MVP race while Jordan, who would end up finishing second, was averaging an absurd 37 points per game. The Celtics came out with an unusual starting five due to the absence of Dennis Johnson, who was replaced by Jerry Sitching. And playing away from home, they knew it would be a tough game. But right from the first plays of the game, Bird showed what kind of night he was going to have. His off-ball movement was elite, basically, because of his enormous basketball IQ, his fakes, I mean, this was one of the most dangerous men in basketball without the ball in his hands. That, coupled with the gravity he generated from his mid-range and long-range shooting, was lethal. Plus, he was a typical player who was blessed by the divine touch, okay? 
But once again, his arsenal from the low post was unpredictable. It's easy to find samples of his off-ball ability and gravity, as it was often his easiest way to score. But on this day, his mid-range shot was touched by a magic wand. He just couldn't miss, and he was able to abuse it again and again and again. Meanwhile, Jordan began to realize the enormous attention he was getting from the Celtics defense, which every time he attempted a drive sent multiple bodies to stop him. But far from getting advantages only without the ball in his hands, Larry was also able to score in isos from the low post, a move that decades later, Mavs legend Dirk Nowinski patented and made his own. So the Bulls realized they had no choice but to do what the Celtics did with Jordan, a virtually continuous two-on-one when he had the ball in his hands. So Bird basically said, you know what, I'm going to hurt them in transition. Thus came the end of the first quarter, in which somehow the Bulls managed to stay close on the scoreboard, trailing by only one point, 36 to 35. Bird had a spectacular first quarter in scoring, 20 points, nothing more, nothing less. So he began to take advantage of that extra attention to test his versatility. He was able to transform garbage into gold. Case in point, this loose ball, which he turns into a great assist. And if there's one thing you don't want, it's for the guy who's destroying you from mid-range to start showing signs of his playmaking ability. Bird was unleashed, and players like Kevin McHale appreciated it. Even when they didn't count, Larry's passes were simply spectacular. No, he really didn't even need to score to be the most impactful player in the game. In some cases, MJ had to defend the Celtic star too, and the size difference played a key role in these situations. But knowing that the half-court offense was very difficult with two defenders on top of him, Bird continued to make use of scoring in transition. And what was more shocking, a player of his size dropping threes like it's nothing. But incredibly, despite Bird's 33 points in the first half, the Bulls managed to go into halftime trailing by only three points. Thanks in part to the 16 points MJ had scored during the first two quarters, of course. When the third quarter began, Larry kind of relaxed offensively. He decided to use his gravity to try to find better options for his teammates, as he knew he would need one more offensive threat to take the game easily. And stepping up on defense, the Celtics got stops on Jordan that allowed them to get easy baskets on the other end of the court. But Bird continued his playmaker role for most of the rest of the game as he led his team on defense with actions like this one. He was certainly a player who had no problem getting his hands dirty either. But when Larry attempted a shot during the second half, it was to score. And he kept sending occasional reminders to the Bulls defense. Reminders that one player was not going to be enough to guard him. In front of a United Center packed with more than 18,000 fans, the forward was having a legendary game. The Celtics allowed just 22 points in the third quarter, by the way, and managed to head into the final quarter with a nine-point lead. And after resting for a couple of minutes, Larry continued to do whatever his team needed to do to get the win. These Celtics were good. I mean, like, really good. Bird was that piece of the puzzle that served as a wild card, too. That player you could put in any role, in any part of the court, in any situation, and who was going to be able to generate advantages on his own. And during the last quarter, the tone did not change. Bird continued to abuse from long distance as he had been doing all game. He continued to play the simplest yet most dominant basketball anyone had ever seen. But one of the virtues of genius is to make what seems complicated really easy, you know? And despite the Bulls' final scare, who managed to cut the deficit from 11 points to 4, the Celtics defense stepped up to close the game. Bird did it. Months after MJ scored 63, the forward only had to play 100% for one half to show him that if he wanted to, he could do it too. 33 points in the first half, 41 in the game. That went down in history as one of the greatest displays of ego any player in the league could perform. The difference is that Larry's ego also made his teammates better. Weeks later, the Celtics met the Bulls again in the first round of the playoffs. And the result was the same as last year. Boston managed to advance by a score of three wins to zero. Yeah, so 6-0 in playoff games against Jordan's Bulls. That's the record that is stuck in history. When they met, Larry's Celtics were always better. So good that not even a superhero performance could stop them. And so Larry Bird, along with the Pistons of Isaiah Thomas and Bill Lambeer, became the thorn in MJ's side that he really could never get rid of. Bird did not win the ring that season. Magic Johnson's Lakers did. 
the other side of the three-headed monster that dominated basketball worldwide. But even if he didn't win the championship, Larry did world basketball a favor. He taught Jordan that he still had a long way to reach his full potential. He taught him that scoring isn't always enough and that he needed to become a leader capable of bringing out the best in his teammates. And without the lesson that the greatest player in Boston Celtics history, with Bill Russell's permission, taught MJ, it is likely that basketball history would have been completely different. And Jordan and Bird's rivalry continued to cause a stir in the league, but they never met again in the playoffs. Larry would go on to post a 17-11 and 11 record against Michael's Bulls during his career, until a serious heel injury followed by back problems greatly shortened his career. Injuries that not only brought about the end of the Boston Celtics dynasty, but also sent them into a sinkhole from which they could not climb out of until 20 years later. And we all know that history is written by the winners, and very few people have won more than Jordan. And Larry Bird has kind of gone down in history as underrated compared to Jordan. But he was a forward who changed the traditional definition of basketball and who starred in one of the most competitive eras ever. And let's not forget that from 1983 to 1986, there was not a single player on the planet able to face him. No one. All right, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you thought down in the comments and we'll see you in the next one.